Hey, I'm Lexi, and this is What You Should Know. I know I have been gone a little longer than usual, and I would like to apologise. I really did not intend on skipping last week, and then throwing the whole rhythm off. But I'm in the midst of so much happening right now. I'm getting married early this year, and there is a chance that I may have to move state, so I'm just a little bit frazzled right now. But I would like to thank you all so much for your patience and all your kind words. You really have no idea how much it means to me. And if you really want to make a ghoul happy cry, go hit up that five-star review button. Guaranteed to make me ugly cry from joy. So from 1948 all the way back to the 1800s, I have been on a bit of a history kick lately. And oh boy, do I have a wild ride for you today and next week. Because it's a two-parter, baby! Strap in, and this is what you should know about Frederick Deeming. So in a lot of articles, it says that Frederick was born on the 30th of July, 1853, to Thomas and Anne Deeming in Birkenhead, Cheshire, and has been referred to as Australia's first serial killer. I suppose this would be true if you consider Australia was once known as Van Diemen's Land, and those before him would not be given that title. But I'm sure if you put them all in a room, they may fight for it, or not. One of them might actually eat the others. Be an interesting show, that's for sure. But as far as the early life for Frederick, there is not a lot recorded. He grew up in a very religious household, which would negatively impact his life, especially after his mother, Anne, passed away. Frederick did claim that he spent years in an asylum, that he saw her ghost floating outside of his bedroom window, and that he was an epileptic from the age of 18. However, his brother Albert would deny these claims. Unfortunately, while this information would have been super fascinating to dive deeper into, it just didn't exist from where I could find it. So we're just going to have to assume these accounts are either true, and Frederick was extremely unwell and should not have been released, or a pure fabrication he made, much like a bored teenager at a party trying to seem vastly more interesting than they really are. However, at the tender age of 16, he ran away to sea, and subsequently began a long career of crime. His main crimes were thievery and obtaining money under false pretenses, but the paper trail of his life was only really recorded in depth and left as open source from 1880. It was during that year that Frederick returned home and entered into a business with his brothers to carry on gas fitting that they ran in Birkenhead. In 1881, he married his first wife, Marie James, the daughter of a quarryman who resided in Pembroke, Wales. Pin this in your mind, as his first wife, meaning he had more than one by the end of all of it. That same year, he moved to New South Wales, working his passage out as a steward on a passenger vessel. Maria joined her husband in 1882, which, honestly, in that time was not that long of a wait. This fresh start in Australia would not go all according to plan. It was in 1882 that Frederick found a position working in Sydney, but also working for John Danks, a Melbourne importer of plumbing and gas fitting supplies. His Melbourne employers were greatly impressed by his work and extended him £200 of credit to open a business in Rockhampton, Queensland. £200 back then is 30000 782 British pounds today, which in the Australian dollar is $54,769.15. Don't get me wrong, that's really not enough to open a business these days, but that inflation. Damn. The issue with the money that was loaned to Frederick is that it was never repaid. But that wasn't the only issue he had with his work, as Frederick is known to have worked for a Sydney gas fitter where he was charged with theft of brass fittings from his employer. He initially indignantly denied the theft, instead blaming his 15-year-old co-worker. But the items were found at his home, and he was subsequently sentenced to six weeks imprisonment, embarrassing his wife, Marie. Being super dramatic, he pretended to faint when the sentence was pronounced. After he was released, he continued to work in Sydney as a gas fitter until December 1887, where he was again committed to trial. This time, 
on a charge of fraudulent insolvency. Which for those of us not in the know, the Action Fraud website gives the following explanation. Fraud relating to bankruptcy and insolvency can involve companies fraudulently trading immediately before being declared insolvent. AKA, they will take money from people for services they will not complete. Shockingly to no one, Frederick disappeared from New South Wales while on bail. His wife Marie and their two young daughters joined him on a ship called the Barossa, which was travelling to St Helena. The family managed to secure their compartments under the false name Ward. On this journey, Marie gave birth to their third child. Now, I'm already horrified at what birth in the modern day entails, but imagine being at sea on a boat in the late 1800s. No thank you. From St Helena, they then sailed to Cape Colony. Upon arrival, Mr Ward, aka Frederick Deeming, sent his wife and children home to Birkenhead. A lot is not known as to what happened in South Africa, as it is near impossible to gather any trustworthy data. It was Detective Brandt, who was part of the criminal investigation branch of the Victorian Police Force, that said Frederick was well known to have been involved in conducting a Transvaal diamond mine swindle in 1889. Which, a swindle sounds pretty chill, until you read the part of the report submitted by Detective Brandt, which I shall now read out for you all. I have to report that I knew Deeming, alias Williams, at Kimberley on the Diamond Mine Fields in Grickwaland West, South Africa, about 15 years ago, where he first assumed the name Albert Williams, and subsequently that Frederick Deeming at Johannesburg in Transvaal in the South African Republic in 1888. On September 18th, 1888, three murders were committed at Johannesburg. The victims were a white man and two natives. The white man was known as Graham, and he was the officer of the British Army during the Zulu War. The crime was committed on a very dark night in an out-of-the-way street in the mining camp of Johannesburg, a street in which very few people resided. The bodies were very much mutilated, and the crime created a tremendous public sensation. The Transvaal government did all in their power to vindicate the law, but failed owing to the want of a proper police or detective system. After much trouble and expense of the part of the government, the case was handed to me for private investigation by a number of English gentlemen at Johannesburg, and I may add here briefly that from all the circumstantial facts connected with me, inquiries, and the medical evidence which came to my knowledge, I have reasonable grounds to believe that the person referred to is the murder of three persons in question. At Johannesburg from the early parts of March to the commencement of September 1888, the prisoner was connected with all others, and amongst them, Carl Osbitz in a banking swindle of £162,000 at the National Bank of Johannesburg. He was also connected to the swindle known as the Great Kruger Gold Mining Company at Johannesburg and was floated in London for £110,000. So with all of that in mind, not only was he guilty of taking a lot of money that was not his, It is where Frederick had his first potential kills, starting his body count out at three, and he was just getting started. From South Africa, Frederick went directly to Hull, which is a port city in East Riding of Yorkshire, England, where he took up residence and passed himself off as a retired Australian sheep farmer named Harry Lawson. This would be another flamboyant acting challenge he had set for himself, Not that he wouldn't rise to it. After all, he always did. He settled in at the station hotel and announced that he had come to England to hire agents for the sale of expensive clips of wool. He added to this by stating that he resented the exorbitant prices charged by the average middleman. While in Hull, he complained extensively about the noise of the traffic, so much so that the landlord of the hotel suggested that he should consider staying at a hotel in the peaceful town of Beverly. Frederick, who was going by Harry, rented a room in a large lodging house, kept in New Walk by a Mrs. Matheson, who had two daughters. You would assume that Frederick would have disappointed his first wife enough, 
But he was not done doing so, as he was drawn to Mrs. Matheson's eldest daughter. She had been described as a stylish, light-hearted girl who loved to talk. This pig of a man then rapidly set himself to woo her, and during this attempt, which I will admit was successful, he learned a lot about her. Helen Matheson's life up to this point was a hard one. Her father died while she was a child, and she had been taken care of by her grandparents. Helen had decided, whilst growing up, that she wanted to work as a school teacher, and her grandparents were boundlessly supportive of this, as they made sure to give her a liberal education, which was supplemented by two years of college. So she was an educated lady. However, during one of her vacations, she visited her mother in Beverly, and found out that she was in failing health. With such a kind heart, she abandoned her studies and remained home to assist with the housework. Keep in mind that Helen was barely 21 years old, so it was not surprising that she was fascinated by the pictures of Australian wealth and luxury that Frederick had shown her, pulling her in with his lies. Helen noticed that money seemed to be no object to him, and he assured her that he was in the receipt of a permanent income of £1,500 per annum, which in good seasons might increase tenfold. Now, remember that £200 back then is more like 30000 So on average, he is claiming to earn about $225,000 per annum. Minimum. I can't blame her for being interested in a smooth talker who claims to have that kind of money. Heck, I've been swindled by less. And for that reason, it should be no shock to you that when Frederick proposed to her, Helen was ecstatic and accepted. Her friends congratulated her happily on her approaching marriage. They were genuinely thrilled for her, as there was no lover out there more attentive than a thief with a goal. The night before the wedding, which was on February the 18th, 1890, Frederick sent Helen an expensive wedding gift. A large case of solid silver-backed brushes of all sizes and a diamond crescent. He also forwarded her a note in which he informed her that he had tried to find her a bracelet to match, but couldn't find one with diamonds rare enough to suit him. The wedding itself was lavish, and a more stylish wedding had never been seen in Beverly. The bride looked radiant, and in her hair she wore the diamond crescent, which she had received as a gift the night before. Frederick, ever the slave to theatrics, he deemed the village carriages were not worthy of the occasion, and special turnouts were ordered from Hull. The bell ringers had been paid, five pounds by him, and were so impressed by this splashing of cash that their vigorous ringing of the bells threatened the safety of the old church tower. The organist was paid handsomely, which ensured a full harmonic service. The wedding march was played again and again, and the choir dressed in white robes caroled the voices that breathed over Eden. The newly married couple spent three weeks in the south of England and returned to Hull about the beginning of March, where they took up residence at the station hotel. Frederick seemed completely devoted to Helen, almost to the point of forgetting his first wife and their children. Keep in mind, he was still married to her. He often drove her to Beverly to visit her mother and friends, and all seemed to be just perfect until the morning of March 15th. Frederick told Helen that he was going to get a shave and would be back shortly, but he did not return. Helen waiting for hours for him, her anxiety reached its limits, and she sent messengers to inquire for him at his usual haunts, but he was not anywhere that they looked. Mrs. Matheson was communicated with, and after a short discussion with her daughter, decided to report her son-in-law as missing to the police, concerned that maybe he had met with an accident. The police soon discovered the true character of Frederick. After leaving that morning, Rather than go for a shave, he had gone to the jewellers to obtain the diamond bracelet previously ordered from London, which came with a matching necklace and ring, valued in all at £285. Frederick had paid for these items with two cheques from the local bank. This was done on the Saturday, which was a half-day holiday in Hull, and all the banks were closed. On the following Monday, the cheques dishonoured, which means they bounced. It was at this time the proper authorities attempted to follow up with Frederick, who, let's remember at this time, was pretending to be a wealthy sheep farmer named Harry. They found out he had fled the country 
on a boat. As it turns out, he had booked a ticket to South America before he even started to court his second wife, Helen. It turned out that this had all been a con for him to gather further wealth before fleeing the country. This piece of soggy warm lettuce was not just happy conning the working class people of Hull, he decided to rob a woman he pretended to love and took from her all the presents he had given her as well as those that had been given to her by friends and relatives. Even the wedding ring he had purchased for her was done so with cruel intentions. The ring did not fit Helen and he told her that he had taken to get it resized. But when he left, not only did he take the ring and the gifts he had given her, but he had also stolen her hope chest. Which, for those of you not in the know, a hope chest is a box of items a bride will traditionally have on her wedding, filled with jewellery, perfume and the such that she intends to wear on the wedding day itself. Helen was broken hearted and returned to live with her mother. The poor thing struggled with her grief for some time, as you would. The poor thing struggled with her grief for quite some time, as you would if you have ever been truly broken hearted. You know it can take a very long time to get over, and healing is not linear. Sadly, she refused to believe that the man she married was a bastard con artist, and shortly after, a warrant was issued for his arrest, which was successful. Frederick was in Montevideo when he was apprehended, extradited back to England, and there he was sentenced to nine months of imprisonment on charges of false pretenses. Frederick was released in early 1891 and returned to Hull, where he renewed his attentions to Helen. She was almost manipulated into taking on the role of his faithful wife, but it was just more heartbreak for her, unfortunately. It was shortly after this that she learned he already was married, and had a wife and family living in Birkenhead. And with that, Helen wanted nothing more to do with him, and didn't even have the energy to pursue charges of bigamy. Realising that he couldn't find a way to woo her again, Frederick took the money from her and returned to his first wife, Marie, in Birkenhead. Now, in Marie's position, I would have refused to let this lying, cheating, soiled diaper of a man back into my life, let alone my home. But I also lack the grace of Marie as she welcomed him home. But this would not be a happy homecoming at all. Frederick, acting more and more unhinged, accused his poor wife of not only having supplied the police with information which enabled them to trace him to Montevideo, but also trying to have charges of bigamy laid against him. Which, if we look at her history, is not even remotely likely, as she had spent their entire marriage at the risk of her own freedom and safety, protecting him from the police and helping him to escape from justice. So she was really ride or die, which is very unfortunate for her. But eventually, Frederick realised this himself and joined his wife in reality. But in the traditional way that only he and a lot of abusers can do, this did not last long at all. This wet sock left and took a hundred pounds of his wife's hard-earned savings. He crossed the river to Liverpool and started up his con artistry once again, adopted several aliases, and had sex with a young woman he met at a hotel that he was staying at. He started this affair, once again, with outrageous gifts of jewellery, which was later found to be costume jewellery, and weren't worth much at all. This woman was quite lucky, as Frederick intended on having her marry him too. However, his wife Marie showed up in time to put a stop to it all. Frederick was furious and was once again quite abusive to his wife, and managed to flee again this time to Rainhill, a village of about 2,000 inhabitants, two miles and a half from Prescott, Lancashire, and nine miles from Liverpool. It was here that he rented a room at the commercial hotel under the alias of Albert Williams. He claimed he was a military officer, home on furlough from India. His habits of living lavishly did not go unnoticed and made it easy for Marie to locate him, which I get it. It was not a time where you could just leave a man, and she had four children. But she was effectively a highly functional single parent already. She was working and taking care of her children while saving. She had a hundred pounds in savings, which Frederick stole, but in today's money, that is like $7,000. I know people without children 
in a dual income household who struggled to save. So she was a queen and could do so much better than this crusty tissue of a man. But Marie had once again interrupted his process of wooing another young lady named Emily Mather, the daughter of an old and respected village resident. Since Frederick had been parading around as a single man, he had some explaining to do regarding his wife. But while he is trash, he is clever trash, and offered a believable lie. She was his sister. But Marie's perseverance complicated the situation and threatened to undo all of his hard work to woo this woman. And being the disgusting creature he is, Frederick came up with a plan to clear away all obstacles he believed he was facing. With a cool and calm demeanour, he arranged to rent a house known as the Denham Villa, which was situated on the outskirts of Rainhill and entirely isolated. He signed a six-month lease on the 30th of July, 1891, and paid the rent in advance. As he continued on with his plan, he pretended to act as the agent for a Colonel Brooks, and one of the conditions attached to this lease was that the new occupant should be permitted to cement the floor at his own expense. Which, honestly, knowing what comes next just gives me chills. As per other stipulations of this lease, the villa was furnished by a local firm and five barrels of cement which had been ordered in Liverpool in Emily Mather's name were delivered to the house. Colonel Brooks failed to appear, but a lady and some children were noticed by distant neighbours to take up their residence in the villa. Frederick visited her constantly. However, to cover himself, he informed the neighbours that the woman was his sister, and the children his nieces and nephew. I feel like it is obvious, but for those of you who are only paying half attention right now as they are busy, the tenants were in reality his wife and children. What happened next was speculated by detectives once the crime scene was eventually found. The night of August 11th, 1891, Frederick waited until his children were in bed and asleep. How it started we will never know, but by the end of the night, he had slit the throats of his wife and three of his children, and he had strangled his eldest daughter. But while Frederick was quite clever, as all clever people generally are, he was also quite stupid. You see, he poured a large quantity of chloride of lime on the bodies of his butchered family in the belief that it would destroy them. However, it had the opposite effect. Instead of promoting decomposition, it all but stopped it. And when the bodies were discovered on the 16th of March, 1892, the bodies were found in an amazing state of preservation, making the jobs of detectives as easy as if they had stumbled across the fresh bodies. Frederick dug into the floors of the villa, storing the dirt in trunks of the fake Colonel Brooks. The bodies of his wife and children were placed in the grave he dug under the kitchen floor. Marie laid with her face upwards. The two eldest children were placed face down on either side of their mother, and at her feet rest the bodies of their two infants. All the children were in their nightshirts, and Marie was still fully dressed and was tied tightly with a rope. No one has been able to figure out why she was tied up. Frederick covered the bodies of his family with oilcloth and Turkish toweling and poured wet cement over them, encasing them into the earth. That night, neighbours believed they'd heard screams coming from the villa, so the next day they visited, only to find Frederick alone and in such a good mood while he was cementing the kitchen floor. When asked about Marie and her children, he told them that she had gone to Port Said to join her husband. The next day, realising he was not qualified to complete what he had started, he hired a Rainhill tradesman to complete the job of cementing the floor, and that night he returned to the commercial hotel. After this monstrous act, he communicated that the non-existent Colonel Brooks had changed his plans and was not coming to Rainhill and the furniture was then to be auctioned off. Several heavy trunks were dispatched to Plymouth, addressed to Colonel Brooks, but they were never claimed, and when they were finally passed to the police, they were found to be filled with the earth from under the kitchen floor of the Rain Hill Villa, and blood-stained clothes which had been used to mop up the blood. Not only had Frederick employed a tradesman to finish the cementing at the villa, but also employed a cleaner to thoroughly scrub out the house. The cleaner, however, noticed a strong smell of chloride of lime that lingered throughout the home. 
When she asked about it, Frederick explained that the strange odour was due to the drainage being so bad that he had to use a disinfectant. Unfortunately for Marie and the children, and those he would harm in the future, Frederick was a good liar. So far as the villa was concerned, and the sudden disappearance of the woman and her family did not draw any attention at all. Now Frederick was free from his perceived obstacles, he continued his courtship of Emily with increased passion. His lies continued as he would create story for Emily of dangers from which he had survived and elaborated his false position of wealth and social standing. But his lies weren't all verbal. To add credibility to these lies, he would frequently appear in uniform in public. Also hoping to gain the trust of the village, he would spend what little money he had lavishly. But his money was dwindling to nothing and he knew he needed more to keep this position going. So he suddenly went on a rather mysterious visit to London. He gave many reasons for his departure, but the real object was to scam several merchants in Antwerp, where he pretended to be Lord Don. He continued his fraud in London until he felt he had gained enough money to enable to celebrate his marriage with Emily in a lavish style and to leave enough to carry him and his bride out of the country. However, while Frederick was away, the people of Rainhill had been expressing their concerns and had arrived at the conclusion that there was something not quite right about him. The stories which he had told really just did not line up comfortably, and many started to believe that he was lying. The fact Colonel Brooks had never materialised and the disappearance of his alleged sister and her children were also discussed, and the verdict was very much against him. However, Frederick was a wordsmith, and a few more lies explained away any discrepancies. It also helped that he would splash cash to help quell people's concerns. There were those in the community, however, that did not buy any of his lies and would not be distracted with shiny trinkets. And as these people possessed considerable influence, Frederick realised the importance of hurrying on the marriage and leaving the place before he could be unmasked. Emily would not listen to the concerns of others, as she saw it as slander against her future husband, and when the clergyman of the church at which she worshipped suggested that she should wait just a little longer before marrying, so she could get to know her future husband a little better, she scolded him, accusing him of believing in gossip. Emily refused to listen to anyone, regardless of position of power or family attachment, and she married Frederick on the 22nd of September, 1891. The wedding day itself was once again a lavish and festive affair, and he told his bride that he would be taking her to India. He told her and her family that he was to return to Bombay and resume his position of controller of military stores, and were to set sail on the Kaiser Wilhelm II at the end of October. During Frederick and Emily's honeymoon, Frederick had successfully victimised multiple people, stealing more money, and Emily was none the wiser. But it would soon feel like Frederick was out of luck, as the ship that was to take them to India was indefinitely delayed, causing him a lot of anxiety, as he realised that there was a high chance that the police would finally catch up to him and his many aliases. But sadly, he was not out of luck just yet, as on the 2nd of November, a ship started for Australia, with him and his wife safely aboard, thus making him our problem. While on the ship, he would spend a lot of his time boasting about his non-existent careers, and took pride in displaying his jewellery. It was this horrible way of acting that caused the passengers of the ship to really dislike him. However, his wife was making quite the opposite impression. She was petite, quiet, intelligent, ladylike, and altogether lovable. She had a kind heart and was quick to sympathy, and her word was much more respected and believed over her husband's. One of the fellow passengers was quoted at one point as saying about Emily, she was just in the flower of her womanhood. All the stages of girlhood passed, and the thoughtful, serious, solicitous ministering woman of 27 was before us. 
when the ship briefly docked at Colombo, Emily was surprised to learn that they were not going ashore. This would be due to the fact that she was still under the impression that Bombay was their destination. It was at this point the truth started to set in for Emily, as Frederick had not bothered to tell her of any changes, and multiple passengers, when asked some time later, would recall distinctly how, when she came to tell them she was going all the way to Australia, she was red-eyed and unusually agitated. The rose-tinted glasses had fallen from her eyes, and the warnings her friends gave her at Rainhill would have been ringing in her ears. But her disappointment soon faded, and she went back to her formal contentedness. Frederick continued to publicly dote on his wife, and was said to be attentive to her needs. But again, this would not last, and more drama would be stirred up by him. The motive for the next action was likely either money or blackmail, but Frederick claimed that someone had stolen his wife's necklace from their cabin, a necklace of heavy gold set with diamonds and other precious stones valued upwards of a hundred pounds. Acting like a total Karen, he demanded the ship be thoroughly searched, but the captain of the ship did not wish to move forward with this action. Instead, he started a private inquiry and was soon convinced that the theft accusations were altogether false. Not one to play stupid games, the captain accused Frederick of lying, and of course, Frederick was beside himself with rage when he was publicly branded a liar. But this would not stop as he decided on a ship with people who already did not entirely trust him, he made up a charity for a woman in the second class area and started collecting money from those in that section of the ship. Some tried to give him the benefit of the doubt, blinded by the genuine kindness of Emily, but popular prejudice was quickly revived when it was revealed that he had pocketed the money instead of handing it over to the woman that it had been raised for. You would assume this ass hat would sit down and stop being dramatic, but no. He was then accused of having robbed some crew members of three valuable pearls. Finally, on the 16th of December, 1891, the ship made it to the fairway of Williamstown, and Frederick, who kept the alias of Williams, made his farewells and departed to Melbourne. So to clear up that hellish ship ride, it was a month. He couldn't even sit still for a month. Over a month, he managed to cause that much damage. The fact he was not keyholed is a mystery to me, but I assume it had to do with his sweet wife, Emily. The first night ashore was spent at the Federal Coffee Palace on Collins Street, and the very next day, he started a search for a suitable home. Under the alias of Mr. Droon, he rented a villa in Windsor, Victoria. But of course, this would not be a normal case of tenants signing a lease and moving in. Frederick did not waver in his disguise and informed the landlord that he was a recent arrival from the old country who had moved here with his sister, seeking fortune and a better life. Again, with with the thing of him being married to his sisters, again, I just... Mm, I don't like it. It's gross. It was recorded in the book Criminal of the Century, The Windsor and Rainhill Murderer, that his personal appearance indicated that he was a man of substance, but this was only a thin veil of his vulgarity. He was prompt in his payment, and the landlord was thoroughly satisfied with the new occupant he had secured for number 57. The next day, several heavy boxes were delivered to number 57, and of course, this drew attention of the residents of the street. Being neighbourly, they did attempt to gain attention and start a conversation with Frederick as well as Emily. Unfortunately, their efforts were rejected by them, and judgment was passed that he and his alleged sister, which is actually his third wife, were just strange and antisocial. Kind of like me. <laughs> Due to this, rumours began to spread that Frederick was quick-tempered and violent, but there never were any witnesses to yelling or sounds of domestic dispute. But this was short-lived, because just as quickly as Mr. Droon and his, um sister moved in, they left, and once again number 57 was vacated, and the neighbours barely noticed. It wouldn't be until the 3rd of March, 1892, that anyone would step foot in the villa again. It was that day a lady who we shall name Ethel decided to inspect it, fully intending on moving in as she was deeply interested in the amenities surrounding the villa. The landlord, Mr. Stamford, was called upon by her, and she went with him over to the house. It was a quaint villa with a front garden and fencing, and was made up of total seven rooms, which if you've ever lived 
in a historical house, it is quite generous. Upon entry, Ethel was satisfied by the room sizes and presentation. However, a sickly odour had filled the villa. This putrid smell was hard to handle, and Ethel asked about the drainage of the house. Mr. Stamford assured her that the sanitary arrangements had only been recently renovated and no one had been in the house since. Both were curious as to where this stench had come from and started to search for the source of it. After a brief search, it was located in one of the back rooms, where it seemed to emanate from beneath the slate flooring. Understandably flustered about potentially missing out on an opportunity for a new tenant in his home, Mr. Stamford promised to thoroughly clean and renovate the place, and if possible, remove the cause of the smell. What neither Ethel nor Mr. Stamford realised was they were smelling decomposition. So Mr. Stamford persevered and contacted Mr. Connop, who back in this time was effectively a handyman that you would bring to complete repairs required to make a property livable after a previous tenant. Mr. Connop came with one of his men and going from room to room, they searched with little to show for it until they reached the back room. It was here that the stench was overpowering, forcing them to take time before continuing their work. Both men were confused to see the slate flooring was raised several inches above the level of the floor. This could only be possible if earth had moved, or if there was pressure from below. Between that and the knowledge of the smell, it became clear that this was not an issue for maintenance, but instead for the police, as it strongly pointed to foul play. Thankfully, there were no idiots here, and no time was lost in communicating with the police. Two constables promptly answered the call and attended the scene immediately. The constables lifted the slab only to find that it had been laid on a bed of cement, which was emanating the vile smell. Wasting no time, a spade and a pickaxe were purchased, and the constables set to work at breaking through the cement. There was no way they could have been prepared for the gruesome truth that the cement was hiding. The police were horrified to see a human leg in advanced stage of putrefaction sticking out of the cement where they had managed to break through. With a little more chipping and cutting through the cement revealed a whole nude female. While the whole body had been in an advanced stage of putrefaction, it was obvious that in life she had been youthful and quite beautiful. Her body was bent in all angles, almost as if she had been folded to pack easy into the small space. Upon investigation of the body, they found the wounds that likely killed her. And while I could word it myself, the way I found it written was oddly beautiful. Upon the skull were murderous wounds, and the throat was cut from ear to ear. The murderer had done his work skillfully. Police investigated further, trying to find any evidence to help them understand how this young woman came to be encased in cement after being brutally murdered. But nothing of note was found in the house, so they moved on to speak with potential witnesses in the area, and the most observant neighbours and the most observant neighbours said all that they could. After the stranger first rented the house, boxes arrived and an extravagantly dressed lady was seen around. Two weeks later, the boxes were removed and the stranger was seen with his female companion and they both seemed to be quite happy in each other's company and in good spirits. It was just two months when the body of the woman that matched the stranger's companion was found entombed in cement. It was found that roughly four days after the murder of Emily, Frederick wrote a long letter to her mother at Rainhill, explaining that they had moved to Australia because he had been offered a lucrative position as a manager of a tea business in Hong Kong and had decided to take it. Which sounds suspicious to me, but hey, it was the 1800s, and it may have rang true. In the letter he wrote, We have spent a very happy Christmas. Emily is the happiest woman ever seen. She does enjoy herself. This monster wrote all of this while her corpse was slowly rotting in a hideous grave that he had dug for her. He concluded this letter by telling Mrs. Mathers that they were about to settle by the steamer Catathan, and that she had better not write before she had heard from them again, because they could not give her a definite address. It breaks my heart. This poor woman is reading about how happy her daughter is. All the while, she's been senselessly murdered and rotting without anyone who cares for her knowing. And what makes it worse is that he added that once they arrived, Emily would be able to write to her. Deciding it was time to move on, Frederick boarded the steamer Adelaide. And this time, he was on his very best behaviour. He was struck by the charms of a woman on board and was so much occupied in paying her attention he didn't have time to boast and lie about how awesome he is. 
His arrival in Sydney would be the beginning of the end for him, as when he stepped off the ship, he was shocked to come across a man who knew him, Mr. Garn, who had worked with Frederick as a plumber the last time he was in Australia and knew him quite well. Not being one to shy away from a challenge, he took the bull by the horns and greeted Mr. Garn, telling him that things had greatly improved with him since he had left Sydney, and that he had returned to pay back all creditors that he had left owing in 1887. He then skirted how this was the case by lying, saying that a young lady had been placed in his charge in Melbourne, and that he had to go look after her luggage. Happy to see a familiar face, Mr. Garn gave him his address, and Frederick promised to give him a visit and a long chat with him the next evening. Surprisingly, he kept his promise in the most punctual way, and remained with Mr. and Mrs. Garn for several hours. The stories he spun included how Marie had died of a fever at Johannesburg in the Transvaal. Bertha, his eldest child, had been killed by a buggy accident at the same place and only little Marie was left with him. He did not mention the two other children who had been born outside of Australia, banking on the fact that the Garns knew nothing of their existence. He had played the part of a pious penitent, like a complete wanker saying how money had come freely to him, but it had given him no happiness since he had lost his dear wife and child. He then rambled on saying how their sudden and early deaths made him realise that the hand of God was punishing him for his sins he had committed in Sydney. And that is why he had returned to right those wrongs. He would then tell them tales of how his youngest, little Marie, was in Liverpool with her uncle, and that during his time away from her, he had been in South Africa, shaping his story so that he would appear the hero. But having a captivated audience made him overconfident, and he pushed back his hair to show an ugly, raw-looking wound upon his head saying he received it in a fight in South Africa. Unfortunately for him, Mrs. Garn was a sensible woman, and while she knew little of the country and its affairs, she knew about injuries and cuts. After closely examining his head and seeing the wound had not yet started to heal, she said, Why, you must be an extraordinary man if you got that wound so long ago, and it has not yet commenced to mend. Or in other words, she called his bluff and Frederick knew it. But rather than scramble for an answer, he passed off the remark jokingly and soon after left. That was the last Mr. and Mrs. Garn saw of him. But during that week, they received a letter from him where he claimed little Marie had fallen ill and that he was sailing back to be with her and that if she recovered, she would return with her to Australia. And on that note, that's where I'm going to leave it today. You will have to wait for part two, which I promise is going to be super juicy and is going to include the theory and the thoughts on whether or not Frederick Deeming may have been Jack the Ripper. I know, I know, you don't want to wait two weeks for the next episode. And guess what? You won't have to. The next episode will be out at the latest this time next week. If you want to see relevant pictures that I can find regarding this case, you'll be able to see them on Facebook and Instagram at What You Should Know Australia. If you want to reach out, you can do so on those platforms. I do my best to make sure that I respond, I promise. But you can also send an email to whiskapod at gmail.com. That is W-Y-S-K-A-P-O-D at gmail.com. If you haven't already, please hit the five-star review button. I swear every time I see one, I literally run around the house like a little aeroplane. But until next time, stay safe and stay hydrated. Bye!